now. We're going to take some time. We're going to open up the Word of God. We're going to look at the Word of God and, and look at what God has for us today from His Word. We do not come here merely as a social gathering. We don't come here because we don't have anything better to do on a Sunday morning. We don't come here because we believe, we don't come here because we believe that by coming on a Sunday morning that we will gain more favor with God. We come here because we believe who God is. We come here because we believe what God says. And we come here because God has established the church and the worship of him, and that's whom we try to worship here at First Baptist Church. So if you have your Bibles, please open to Acts in the 24th chapter. And I'd encourage you to open up a Bible. You can use your phone or the Bible. If you don't have a Bible, you'll find one in the pew in front of you. And I would encourage you, if you don't have one with you, to grab that Bible right out of the pew. And it is on page, you'll find our text, 1,324. You see, sometimes when you come to church, this may be your first time, or maybe you're a, a new believer. And when I say Acts 24, you may think, man, some people know where it's at, but I have no idea where this thing called Acts is at. And that's why I'll announce the page numbers so that no one will be lost. We can all see from the Word of God what God has for us this morning. But I encourage you to look at the Bible in Acts chapter 24. Before we looked at Scripture, it was a few weeks ago that I was headed down, downstate, to eat supper with a few friends. We were going down to a restaurant in the Troy area. It's a nice restaurant. The name of it was Fogo de Chao, or Brazilian Steakhouse. Ah, some of you have been to one before. Brazilian Steakhouse, where you have as much meat as you can possibly eat or should eat. Cooked like you want it. Those who are spiritual, the medium, medium rare. Those who are still on their journey for the Lord, the well done. And others. But I digress. I digress. I set it down from my house. I've been to this restaurant before. It's with my wife, and we were just chatting and talking, and I-75 went this way, and US-23 goes this way, kind of veers off or straight and kind of 75 veers off. I've traveled this path many times before, and for whatever reason, my mind was somewhere else, talking to my wife and where I thought I was going, and I, I instead of veering off on 75 and continued toward the Troy area, I continued to stay straight on, 70, on, on 23. And though at that point, Those two roads merge and become one. Within a few miles, they are vastly different. Different places. Going different places. Different people on those different roads. And there I was, happily anticipating a wonderful meal at Fogo de Chao in Troy with some friends. And there I was, going the wrong direction. I'd like to say, honey, that I remembered the first mile, but it wasn't the first mile. In my ignorance, in my complete bliss of life, happily driving along, it wasn't the second mile. It wasn't the third mile. It was approximately 10 miles. (laughs) Wow. Look at you just laughing at me like, ha ha, pastor, stinks to be you. Absolutely. When all of a sudden I passed this landmark, and I thought, oh, that's right, I'm, I'm heading right toward Novi, because there's another Brazilian steakhouse in Novi. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm there, I'm about this far away. And then this fleeting thought in my mind, I shouldn't be going toward Novi. I'm supposed to be going toward Troy. And then that processing moment, Dr. Martin, as you're driving, like, what do I do next? There's the turnaround, there's the exit, there's the time, the reservation is, there's the food, there's the people meeting us there, and there's the idiot in the driver's seat. I wish I could have blamed someone else. I wish I could say, you know, my, my wife, my beautiful wife distracted me, and, but it wasn't her fault. I wish I could blame the GPS, but I wasn't using GPS. No, my friends, the blame of that wrong route and road lied squarely on the person driving the vehicle at that moment, none other than J.D. Howell. You ever gone to the wrong place or gone the wrong way? Hopefully, it is not a 10-mile mistake 
or like someone I'm very close to who made like a 100-mile mistake. Today, I'd like to, from the Word of God, point us out to a portion of Scripture. We're going to hear about these two words called the way. Seemingly neutral. Seemingly simple. Almost as if it's not pertinent to a conversation. If someone were to ask you directions on how to get to your house, you could say, well, we'll just go that way. And they probably would respond, well, what does that mean? Well, go the way. Go the right way. Well, that's what I'm asking. And almost when we will look at this passage, we could almost skip over the truth that is found here. We're going to go here and we'll go back to some other passages in, in Acts and then tie it to some other portions of Scripture and to see there's a powerful truth that God has for us this morning. Because it's his word, and it's his way. So if you would, look at me, please, in Acts chapter 24. Before we look at this, just remember, I can remind you, please, what is happening here. Paul is now being accused of bringing heresy, false teaching, and sedition to the Jewish way. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the chief priests those in religious authority and those who have been religious are accusing Paul of disrupting everything they believe. He has been almost, we looked at last week, literally pulled apart, not just figuratively, but he was rescued by the chief captain because they were threatening to, to yank his body into pieces, literal pieces, separating arm from body. He's been rescued from that, and now he has an opportunity to hear the charge, and to give a defense for how he has now been living and to answer these charges, why are you disrupting, why are you going against the religion of the Jews? So let's pick up in chapter 24, verse number 1 of Acts, or page 1324 in the Bible in the pew. And after five days, Ananias the high priest descended with the elders And with a certain orator named Tertullus, who informed the governor against Paul. Now in that time, in that day, they would hire people to speak at these times. To be an orator, to be a a speaker, was considered a very high privileged occupation. People would study, would practice, and would be esteemed highly when they could speak fluently and speak succinctly and and articulate these concepts. And so the the chief priests, these religious leaders, rather than make their own charges, though they did previously, they hired, they brought this orator to really convince the governor of the problems of the apostle Paul. We will discover, as we read, you'll discover that Paul does not hire his own orator. He just speaks as the mouthpiece of the Lord. And so here we stand in this In this place, and Tertullus is now informing the governor against Paul. Verse number two, and when he was called forth, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, seeing that by thee we enjoy great quietness, and that very worthy deeds are done unto this nation by thy providence. We accept it always and in all places, most noble Felix, with all thankfulness. You could classify verse 2 and 3 as political malarkey, as hogwash. The Jews did not appreciate any type of opposition. They were not thankful that they were under any rule from the Romans or under authority. They were not glad for Felix. They were not appreciative of the apparent, quote, order that Rome had brought to their country. In fact, if you will dial back in your minds to when Jesus Christ was ascending into Jerusalem or Palm Sunday, the Jewish nation at large were casting down branches and throwing their coats as the Lord, Jesus Christ, rode in on the donkey, the symbol of a coming king, 
and they're rejoicing because they anticipated, as did the disciples, that Jesus Christ would now finally overthrow the Roman government and would reestablish the Jewish rule and that they would have their own autonomy and not be under any other, other rule. But now at this time, in this case, of course, the orator is going to get and begin by merely flattering that the one who's ruling. All right, so it is political malarkey right here. Verse number four. Notwithstanding, that I be not further tedious unto thee, I pray thee that thou wouldest hear us of thy clemency a few words. For we have found this man, this is the apostle Paul he's referring to, a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes, who also hath gone about to profane the temple whom we took and would have judged according to our law. But the chief captain Lysias came upon us and with great violence took him away out of our hands commanding his accusers to come unto thee by examining of whom thyself mayest take knowledge of all these things, whereof we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, saying that these things were so. Then Paul, after that the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, For as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. Because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues nor in the city. Neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. Verse 14 will be our text for today. Verse 14, Paul is going to now give a defense for what he has been doing, for what he has been living his life for, for the philosophy, for the doctrine, for the belief that is so altered, Saul, now Paul's life, that would cause him to bring the Jewish nation, these leaders, into an uproar, that would cause him now to have to stand before a governor to answer for himself, What so moved Paul? What so changed Paul? What was so transforming in his life? In in verse number 14, but this I confess unto thee, that after the way, which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. And have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. What was the way? Why did Paul take a moment to say, this way? that is now called heresy, is the way which I live, the way that I bring people toward, the way that I challenge those whom I meet, this way that that means that I worship the God of their fathers, the God who will raise the dead and has raised the dead, the God whom I now serve, and and Paul says, who I seek to have a conscience void of offense, all wrapped up in this little concept called the way. This way caused a lot of consternation in the Jewish nation. This way was labeled heresy. This way was in direct opposition to the religious community. And this way, when someone followed this way, there were real life, outward displays of genuine transformation. The reason that they were so angry with Paul is because when people followed this way, it was different. 
It was not just something they signed up for by mail or by email and no one saw an effect. It was not just something that at a particular service or an event, they would come forward and then with no effect on their life. No, my friends, when someone began to follow this way, and we'll look at this in just a moment, what what this entails, this way, it absolutely revolutionized their life. It changed their destination from hell to heaven. It changed their desires from themselves and their worthless, empty religious deeds into a desire to please the God of heaven. It changed their old nature into a brand new nature, and it touched their life. It touched their giving. It touched their generosity. It touched their faith. It touched their contact with their neighbors. It touched their relationship with their government. It touched every part of their life. This is what happened and why this way was so different. My friend, the call is still the same, to follow the way. Lord, I ask for your help today as we look at this passage and these passages of Scripture. And Lord, I pray that you would touch us. Lord, that you would illuminate in our minds areas, particular issues that we're facing, whether they're mentioned or not. Lord, I pray you touch our heart emotionally. Lord, convict us, correct us. And Lord, I'd ask that today you would meet with us here. There'd be no distractions in the service, Lord. The the devil seeks to divide and distract through every bit of it, but Lord, especially during services and as we open your word. And Lord, we're not special, but you're special. And your word is special. So Lord, I pray your word would go forth with power, would accomplish all that you desire to accomplish this morning. Lord, we pray that everything you want to have happen will happen today. Lord, we love you in Jesus' name, I ask. Amen. Kind of interesting in the book of Acts, this little concept of the way. We're going to keep our fingers here in Acts chapter 24, but we're going to go on a little bit backward journey in the book of Acts, if you would, this morning. So keep your finger here, and first, please, turn back to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. If you use the Bible in the pew, it's going to be page 1,315, 1315. This is the first introduction we have to this to this concept of this way. I want to kind of just take a moment, give us a little bit of background, and then give us three significant truths about about what I think the Bible is going to teach us here. We find in Acts chapter 9, uh, verse 1, uh, the same character we find in Acts chapter 24, different name, same character. It's before uh, Paul's gospel interaction, before he got saved, his name was Saul. We find out that this was happening in chapter 9, verse 1, and Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that he, if he found any of, what's the next two words? This what? This way. Whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. This was not an unknown concept. In fact, Saul's mission in life before he got saved was to hunt down those who followed the way. This way. The way of Jesus Christ. And you know how he found them? He found them by their testimony. He found them by their worship. He found them by their life. He found them by what they would say with their lips, professing Jesus Christ as Lord. He would find them as they worship, as they live. It wasn't like like he couldn't find them. He would find them and throw them into jail. And he couldn't stamp out these people who would follow this way. If you continue on in your Bibles, return to Acts and the 19th chapter. Acts chapter 19. Verse number six, and when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied, and all the men were about twelve. And he went to the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of 
Next two words. That way. Before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one, Tyrannius. Go down, please, in the same chapter, in the same chapter, to verse number 22. So he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus. But he, that is Paul, stayed himself in Asia for a season. And the same time there arose no, no small stir about, what's the next two words? That way. Are you starting to see maybe a little, a little bit of a, 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 just a, a connection in the book of Acts now? Now, we know that eventually these people of the way were going to be called Christians. But before they were called Christians, they were often referred to as people of the way. People of the way. Turn over just another page uh, to, to Acts chapter 22, or maybe two pages in your Bible, Acts chapter 22. where we find Paul's going to begin to give his testimony. And in verse number four, he says this, and I persecuted this, what's the next word? This way. My friends, throughout the book of Acts, and we also find it in Acts chapter 18, where uh, Apollos is going to be taught in the way more perfectly. We find throughout the book of Acts this concept of the way. And it's not lost, and it should not be lost in us, that this is not insignificant. This is not a mistake that, that, that God made when he gave us this word to refer to this, this concept of living for God as the way. Because this way is so significant. This way is so, uh, uh, such a way of life. It is a way that brought reproach, a way that brought opposition, a way that brought persecution, and it was a way of life. It was not merely a one-time moment, but it was a path, a journey, a way to live. And I'm afraid that sometimes, Christian, we think of the Christian life as a decision or decisions rather than what it is. It's a way. It's a way of life. It's not just, well, I was saved when I was six. Now, that was the moment that you began this journey. But my friends, that's not the end. That's the beginning. When someone puts their faith in Jesus Christ, they now are on the way. I think this is significant because if we're not careful, we'll be, we'll be deceived into thinking that what we do on Sunday is different than how we ought to live on Monday. And being a Christian is not just about coming to church Sunday morning and singing a few songs and standing up at the right time and sitting down at the right time and then praying and opening the word of God. Though I'm glad you do that and we ought to be in church worshiping together. And being a Christian is not just coming back Sunday night and singing a few more songs and then praying together and seeing the word of God. Though you ought to be back in church Sunday night. My friends, being a Christian is Monday morning waking up and walking the way with Jesus Christ. And Monday night, you, you, before you go to bed, you're walking the way with Jesus Christ. And Tuesday morning, you do the same thing. And Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday, and Saturday, and you come back to church Sunday. The way is not just a decision. It is a path of life. So this morning, if I can give you three significant truths about this way from the Word of God. The first one is this. The way is all about Jesus. Now, some of you are already connecting this verse. I hope you do. If you haven't, I'll put it on the screen. John chapter 14, verse 6. But, I, but I'd like you, though, it, we'll say verse 6 on the screen, but verse 5 is almost as powerful. In John chapter 14, a passage of scripture that we often use because it begins with, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. It's Jesus Christ. He says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I go and prepare a place for you that where I am, there ye may be also. And then Thomas. Thomas, the disciple, asked this question. Lord, we knowest not whither thou goest. How can we know the See, you didn't even know you knew that verse, did you? And Jesus said this in John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus saith, I am. The way is all about Jesus Christ. 
It is not just a list of do's and don'ts. The way is not wear modest clothes and cut your hair. The way is not do this and don't do this. There will be those choices on the way, but that's not the way. The way is all about Jesus Christ. The religious community that Paul was arguing against was saying, no, this is what you're supposed to do. Do this and don't do this. Take this many steps on a Sabbath and don't take this many steps. And make sure you tithe of, of all that you have and, your, and, and all of your herbs in the garden and everything you have. And, and Jesus said, hold on. I'm not saying these things aren't important, but what is most important is following me. Jesus says, follow me. I am the way. The way is all about Jesus Christ. When you come to church, I hope you learn about Jesus Christ. And when you go home, I hope you remember to meditate in Jesus Christ. It's not up for my own interpretation. You see, a lot of people want to reinterpret the way. They want to say, well, it's Jesus and Jesus said, I am the way. A few years back, there was a wilderness area with some trails. They collected the comment cards about these wilderness trails. Hiking paths, you know, put on your hiking shoes, your marrows, or whatever you choose, your poison is, and, and you hike. Anybody ever done some hiking? You with me so far? Hiking trails, like in the woods? You with me so far? It's not in Walmart, no air conditioning. All right, hiking trails. Here are the comments they received that the wilderness area where the hiking trails received, how they needed to upgrade and change their hiking trails. The trails need to be reconstructed. Please avoid building trails that go uphill. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let me just move this mountain aside for you. you know, is that better in your life? Too many bugs and leeches and spiders and spider webs. Please spray the wilderness to rid the area of these. What's your job? Well, I'm a wilderness path sprayer. Please pave the trails. Chairlifts need to be in some places so that we can get to wonderful views without having to hike to them. Hiking trails? The coyotes make too much noise last night and kept me awake. Please eradicate these annoying animals. And there are too many rocks in these mountains. Now, my friends, if you went hiking and you were with someone who was saying these things, you first of all would think they're joking. But if they were serious, you'd look at them and you'd probably say something like, have you lost your ever-loving mind? They probably would be the brunt of the jokes of the hiking group for the rest of the time and thereafter for the rest of their life. Hey, remember when Joe asked for not so many rocks on the, rocky, on the hiking trip? Come on, guys. It was like 10 years ago. Dude, it was still stupid. But my friends, how many times do we want to reconstruct the way of Jesus Christ? The way is Jesus Christ. Lord, can you please reconstruct the, pale, the, the trails so there's no uphill, no uphill climbs? Jesus never said his path would be easy. He never said there wouldn't be any opposition or persecution. Just ask those Christians. Just ask the apostle Paul. Paul was a persecution? No, Paul said, still, I was on the way. And he didn't say it'd be easy, but he did say this, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. You see, the way is all about Jesus Christ. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you, that we, that I should follow his steps. Jesus not only is the way, Jesus walked the way. When he came down to earth, the Bible says that he was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. He traveled the path before us. He felt the things that we would feel. And the Bible says, for we have not an high priest who cannot be touched with our infirmities. We can't even say, well, Jesus, you don't know what it's like. He does know what it's like. You see, he says he's the way. And we can just follow him. Number two. Number two. The way is specific. The way is specific. You're either on the right path or you're not. You're either going toward Fogo to Chow or you're not. You're either living for Jesus Christ or you're not. 
You see, once someone is saved, their final destination is cemented. We cannot lose our salvation. I've trusted in Jesus Christ as my Savior, and on the authority of the Word of God, I will never spend a moment in hell or the lake of fire. That's based on the authority of the Word of God. But after I'm saved, I'm either following Jesus Christ specifically, or I'm not. Too often, people want to pretend they're following Jesus. And we want to pretend, and we're not. Not in our choices, not in our desires, not with our job, not with following the word of God. Oh, we loosely can point back to the way. So that's right, the Bible says this. I prayed about it, and we can point. That's the way over there. Maybe once in a while, step on it. But the way is specific. When Paul actually saw at that moment was persecuting those Christians, those people of the way, he found those who were specifically living for Jesus Christ. I wonder if Saul's persecution was still active, how many people from this church will be thrown in jail? Now, I'm thankful for religious liberty. I'm grateful. We are, we are blessed to be able to worship together and to worship without any fear of secret police coming in, of Saul coming in with letters to throw people in jail. But I just wonder, the stakes go that high if you were to walk in the back door today and he said, okay, I'm looking for people of the way, how many he would identify? Would you be thrown in jail? Well, I, I, you know, I brought my Bible to church. You think that's the way? I sang with the songs. You think that's the way? See, the way is specific. It's all about Jesus. But don't miss this, it's a journey. It's a journey. That's what the word means in the Greek. The way, it's a path, it's a road, it's a journey. Literally means it's a journey. <laughs> that means today, tomorrow, I'm living the way. Brings courage brings interaction, but Christian, there are so many opportunities to take little detours. So many opportunities. Now there's hope in this, but there are so many, and I don't even want to call them exits, because once you're saved, you're always saved. I don't want to confuse the doctrine here, all right? Once you trust in Jesus Christ, you are on the path of salvation. I'm talking about after you're saved, live in the way Jesus lived, and live in the right way. There are so many detours. And I don't like detours on the real road, and I don't like detours on the spiritual road. Right now, I live right off Curtis Road. If you've been down that direction, there's a significant detour on Dixie Highway. There's a stoplight where there wasn't one before. And there's not a day that I go in that that I think, wow, this is great. Right? Every time I'm like, this is inconvenient in my life. I don't like detours in real life. I don't like details in spiritual life. But my friends, how many times does J.D. Howell take a detour? Where I allow my flesh, all right, perhaps my own irritations or my own selfishness to, to make me stop pleasing the one who I'm trying to follow. How about those times when I, I'm faced with choices and, and rather than, than lean on God, I lean on my own understanding, my own logic. Come on, man. I'm, I'm, I know you do the same thing. There are so many detours on the way. It's a journey. But here's the wonderful truth. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And my friends, that is not a verse for the unsaved who have never been on the path. That is for those who are on the way who have realized they've gotten off the way and want to get back on the way with Jesus Christ. It is a simple turning from whatever you're going. And this is what it took that day uh, when I was driving down. It took J.D. Howell trying to get to forward a child to get off U.S. 23, 
all right, and maneuver my way, right, honey, through all these stinking back roads, all right, because the land of 14 billion lakes all between 23 and 75, all right, not a straight shot, I'm winding, I'm stopping, and there's traffic, and every moment I'm like, my goodness, and I can't blame anyone but J.D. Howell, all right, and sometimes spiritually, as you come back to God, the path back, as we live for God, sometimes can be convoluted. Not his fault. He never intended that. That's my fault. That's our fault. It's your fault. It's a little bit convoluted, but every step knowing that I'm on the right path now, I'm on the right way, I will get where I need to go. A little bit different, cost me a little bit more gas, and a little bit of mockery from friends. But what if I, that day, acted like some Christians do? Well, it's too hard to get over there. It's too hard to get off the path I'm on. I've already lived this way for 10 years. Eh, it'll be okay. It'll be fine in the end. Now how many people hear the conviction of the Lord, realize, listen, you're not on where you're supposed to be right now. And won't take that exit of repentance, asking God for forgiveness. And God says, you do that, I'll receive you. I will, I will help you right where you are and walk with you every step where you're supposed to be. Illustration, then I'll be done today. We went on vacation a few weeks ago. Appreciate the church letting us go. Some great time with the family. We took a trip. We took a trip up to a place called Crisp Point Lighthouse. So if there are peninsula, some maybe have been there before. It's about 18 miles off a paved road. Dirt roads. We had Polaris Ranger, and so I read the instructions. We want to do some rock hunting, and uh, one thing we like to do as a family is sometimes eat supper on the beach. The kids had asked, Dad, can we do that again? A few years back, I surprised them, had hot dogs, marshmallows, things like that. So I said, sure. So I got these instructions, and... Uh, Online, if you were to Google these, how to get to Chris Point Lighthouse, it'll tell you how to follow the, this route. It'll tell you, first of all, don't stay after dark. That was my whole intent, to stay after dark. It's the way we roll the Howell House. But say, be very careful, because you can easily get lost. So many turns, so many places that you can just, right here, whoop, right here. To be honest, we headed up there, went to church Wednesday night, and said, okay, after church, we're just jumping on the road and going up there. So it was already a little bit later at night. Sent my wife all these things, and they said this, don't follow your phone's GPS. It'll take you to the wrong place. Now, my friends, that's not the sermon, but that could be a sermon. <laughs> all right, spiritually, what things you ought not follow. So we pulled the, our vehicle over, un unhitched the, uh, the, the, the ranger, started jumping on this thing. To be honest, I was a little bit nervous. Out of all the warnings, and one other warning I'll share with you in just a moment. We get there, I told my wife, here, I'm going to send you all the screenshots because our phones aren't going to work up there. And, and they said up there in that area, there's some, there are some woods and some trees that are some of the most untouched in the entire eastern seaboard. That's what they say. It's beautiful. As we're driving, all right, we're looking. We're watching. They said, drive about six miles, you're going to see this sign of this little navigation place. And sure enough, about 6.2 miles came up. There it is, a little sign, a little sign right there. Lighthouse this way. And so it's just a simple, like, a few more miles, fork in the road, right here. A little bit farther, right here. A little bit farther, right here. Before you know it, 40 minutes later, we arrived. My wife and I were talking, I'm like, it actually wasn't that bad. People made it seem to be so scary and so hard, but it was like, man, just one little rotation wheel at a time. One little step at a time. One little peace moment, kind of like in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy steps. It pass. Well, they said the way back in the dark is what you shouldn't do. Well, it's dark. We're coming back. I said, honey, we just got to watch the turns, make sure we come back the right way. So we're coming back, we just take a left, take a little right. Before you know it, wreck the vehicle. 
Fine, that's the way we ought to live the Christian life. Sometimes people talk about, oh boy, don't do that at night. Don't do that during the day. It's so scary. You just simply follow Jesus. Be on the way, the path today. You walk, you walk, you have a decision. Here, here. I can tell you from personal experience that 75 and US 23 don't always end up in the same spot all the time. So you just take the right path. Wisdom, counselors. But if you get on the wrong path, just go back. This morning, simply, I want to point you to the way. This way, that way, whatever way you want to say it, the way of Jesus Christ. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then today you need to accept him. That is the entrance ramp to the way, if I can you say it that way. Simply believing in Jesus Christ. In a moment, we'll give you a chance to, to ask Christ to save you. But Christian, if you're saved, are you traveling on the way? Does your prayer life look like you're on the way? Does your time with God, would it, would it bring jail time from Saul, from your time with God? Are you following Christ's instructions? Are your decisions lining up with his way? In raising your kids, in spending your money, in your appetites, your desires, your small choices, your big choices, are you traveling on his way? If not, we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness.